with me, then you've got the next session. It's all your phone, as long as you can set through lessons to you, Rick. We've cracked it. Um, <laughs> thank you for uh, thank you for letting me present. Um, so yes, a couple of people have actually asked me about the uh, the title of this presentation, "Breathe a New Life into Archaeological Soils." And they said you never mentioned it was anything to do with the area project. So I guess, sorry. <laughs> um, but the reason for the title is because basically 95% of world food is derived from soils. And around the globe, 30% of these soils are actually classified as being degraded. And this comes from the FEO in their 2015 report. Um, and as far as irrigation agriculture is concerned, with these soils, 20% of these soils are actually irrigated. However, this doesn't equate to 20% of the um, agricultural production, it actually equates to 40% of the world's agricultural production. Now, obviously in sub-Saharan Africa, um, over the, the coming years, we're going to have severe population pressure, and this obviously requires increased yields. Um, and sub-Saharan Africa has actually been identified as um, an area across the globe that actually has the most potential to try and increase yields um, as far as agriculture is concerned, particularly as far as irrigation agriculture is concerned. So this brings us to the research rationale um, of the area project itself and this particular presentation. So we have two questions. So based on the specific area, which I'm going to tell you about in the next couple of slides, have farmers breathed new life into soils that are seen across the abandoned semi-arid landscape? Have they actually done that? And the second question we're going to try and answer is, are archaeological farming practices already identified in previous work still influencing the productivity of present-day farmers through the legacy of historic agricultural management. So as far as the presentation is concerned, what I'm going to try and do is give the vital statistics of the site um, that we're looking at, um, what's already understood about the site, um, what kind of sampling we did and where it occurred in relation to each other. Um, and then we'll look at morphology. we'll look at some bulk um, geochemical results and then give you a brief indication of the management practices um, that were identified when we did some um, local community interviews. And then hopefully come up with some conclusions and then try and find out what these conclusions will actually, what, what are the implications of these actual results to us in the present day. So if anybody was at DIG um, in 2015, this was when I started first talking about the site of Nguruka, which is in Tanzania. And as far as the vital statistics are concerned, okay, so it is located um, at the southernmost end of the, um, the Rift Valley. It's within shooting distance of five volcanoes, several of which that are still active. It has a bimodal rain pattern. So in the lowland areas where the site of Engaruka is, per year there's around about 400 millimetres of rain. However, in the Crater Highlands, where the Ngorogoro National Park is, very, very nice, pretty animals, cracking. Um, <laughs> They've got a slightly bit, uh, they've got a, a bit more rain, so um, they've got um, 1,400 millimetres, and that actually feeds springs that supply the Engaruka River, which eventually comes down from the Crater Highlands into Engaruka itself. Um, the site is massive, it's 2,000 hectares of agricultural ter terraces and settlements. But when I say settlements, that only equates to around about um, 30 hectares. So the agricultural site itself is immense. And yes, the site is susceptible to soil erosion. 
Okay, so there's alluvial fans coming down from the highlands, you can actually see them, and that is what the agriculture is built on. As far as archaeological pedigree is concerned, um, Lewis Leakey passed by in 1935 and went, smashing, it's a lost city. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, due to excavations done by um, Homer Sassoon in the 1960s, it was realised that the site was actually vast and it was agricultural. But it's not been until recently that we've actually tried, that we've actually identified that the, the, the lines that you actually see across the landscape do not necessarily delineate fields, but they're the actual start of huge revetment walls, which we'll show you in a wee second. So, a terrace, you see. So yes, the landscape is covered in terraces and sediment capture fields. Now this here is one of those revetment walls. So when you walk across the landscape, unless you've got some archaeologists digging it, all you see is this line of stones. Yeah? So to think that it's delineating a field, that's smashing. But what we're seeing is that when we dig down, these revetment walls are actually um, covered by up to around about three metres worth of sediment. And what happens as far as these erected walls is concerned is they're not built in one fell swoop. So anybody that built these never actually saw them to their extent. We are lucky enough that we can. Um, but what happens is the sediment comes in, it's deposited in the field, and then they put another layer of stones on and capture more sediment. It gets buried, put another layer of stones on, and therefore capturing sediments behind these revetment walls um, to utilise as fields. And as you can see here, a lovely picture of where we sampled. This is in, actually in the middle of the field and it gives you an ind indication of the amount of sediments that have been captured. So the site also has hillside terraces and our previous excavation that we did in Consul in Ethiopia, we actually um, realised that these hillside terraces yeah, were actually built not to stop the soil erosion, but to preserve what's already been eroded. So these are a secondary feature. This is what they're after. So therefore, as far as soil erosion is concerned, these landscape engineers that are in Nguruka captured the sediments, they wanted the soil erosion and therefore later on to keep these fields from being inundated with more, then we built these hillside terraces. Now as far as the hillside terraces are concerned, the site is delineated. So this is your settlement and you look down onto this here which was where all our fields are, our sediment capture fields. So the site itself, what we were actually looking at for, um, for, for this presentation, we're looking at a banana grove and we're looking at a site that we've called Section 4. I know it's, it's very imaginative, but hey. <laughs> and if you want to read about Section 4, um, we've just had a paper published on the results that, that come from that in quaternary research. However, this just gives you an indication of the, um, where these sites are in comparison to each other. So this is Section 4 here. yeah, And Section 4 was opened up during the... Um, during a heavy rainstorm in 2010, creating a gully that allowed us to sample. Obviously, they knew that we would want to come along and sample, and a gully formed, smashing. <laughs> and this here is the banana grove. Lovely and green in comparison to what we see here, which is very, very barren and very, very sparsely vegetated. So as far as the sediments on the site are concerned, I said 
that there is five um, different volcanoes that have actually provided the parent material for this area. Um, and just to make sure that our two sites, the Banana Grove and Section 4, had the same um, parent material that was allowing, allowing the soils to develop. Um, we checked the molar ratio as far um, and it confirmed the micromorphological analysis that yes, the parent material was similar. The only difference that we were seeing within, the, um, within Section 4 and the Banana Grove was the size of the coarse fractions. They were slightly bigger in, the, uh, in Section 4, but we'll come on to that in a wee second. As far as Section 4's micromorphology was concerned, um, this has already been discussed, if anybody can remember. Um, but what we were seeing is we're seeing um, a variability as far as the water management strategies are concerned. And this was identified um, through different um, hydrological pedology. So in the top of the set, oh, I've got the same problem. In the top of the section, um, we're seeing a very, very fine crumb, and then we're seeing um, calcitic coatings. Then we're seeing hyper coatings further down the section, um, and then at the bottom here, in um, context two, uh, 4026, we're actually seeing um, pendant calcitic coatings. So we know that through this pedology that it gives us an indication that there's different water regimes at the bottom. We've got inundation, and then we've got wetting and drying. And then here we've got very, very fine sediments with not a lot of organic matter in it at all. Moving on to the banana grove, as far as the micromorphology was concerned, it was quite different. Um, possibly due to, obviously, the crops that are growing on it now. Um, we didn't manage to dig down as far as we'd like to have done in this um, section. However, what we did manage to get down to is about 70 centimetres. Um, and what we're finding is that the samples were taken in the same position as we took in section four, in front of a sediment capture feature in the actual sediment capture field itself but completely different type of micromorphology that we're identifying. What we're getting in the A horizons are um, a high level of um, organic matter, amorphous organic matter. What we're also getting is um, we're getting coatings, we're getting clay coatings, and we're also getting um, laminated aeolian sediments that have the that have seemed to have been dug in. Further down, again, we're getting the um, alleviation of clays with coatings, and then we're starting to see the roots from the banana trees. Next to the banana grove, we also, which is the, the maize field, which as a whole um, is the banana grove, we decided to take some more samples there. Um, and again, what we're seeing in the A horizon is laminated fine sediments that have been dug in, they've been um, truncated. In the bottom, we've got uh, truncated infillings that seem to have been mixed in the B horizon. And what we're also getting, this is quite significant for later on, so pay attention to this bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What we're also getting is quite a lot of cereal grains, which seem to have been burnt. And um, the reason that they seem to have been burnt is because we've got the starch molecules within the cereal grains that have expanded. But not only that, where we were finding these cereal grains, we were getting burnt bone, we were also getting high um, quantities of charcoal, not just micro charcoal, but large chunks of charcoal. Okay. So I'd say this is quite significant. What is also quite significant is the fact that this is the banana grove here and the cows here are actually grazing on the maize stubble. So 
moving on to the soil composition. Now, a lot of this is just hot off the press. It was literally got this on Friday afternoon, so please forgive me. I may have to read some of this because I didn't do this bit of the analysis. Um, did a bit of image analysis, and as you would expect, what we're seeing is we're seeing a greater um, void space within the banana grove itself, so therefore give you an indication that um, bioturbation from the plants is obviously, been, is obviously allowing the soils to develop um, void spaces. What we're seeing as far as particle size analysis is concerned is that we've got high levels of clay within the banana grove itself in comparison to section four here. Now, this points to possibly two, um, two reasons for this. We've either got increased pedogenesis within the banana grove, which is allowing the clays to develop, or because the banana grove is further down the hill, we've got differential deposition through the water of um, the clay. So the larger particles have been deposited in section four, and then further down the hill, the finer particles have been uh, the finer clay particles have been deposited in the banana grove itself. As far as pH is concerned, as you would expect with somewhere that's having lots of in input of organic matter, we have a lower pH. Um, and what we see is, as far as carbon-13 and pH is concerned, we've got a, a pretty decent um, R-squared, pretty decent correlation, um, which suggests that, as far as pH is concerned, then it's organic matter that would probably be decreasing the, the pH. However, what we've got to think about is our irrigation water um, has got lower alkalinity as well, so maybe that has something to do with it too. As far as geochemical analysis is concerned, uh, percentage of carbon and the percentage of nitrogen is high in the banana grove, and there's a strong correlation. So this is suggesting that the, the carbon is organic. However, um, in the lower context of um, section four, what we're seeing is um, we, we know that we have carbonates there. And so, for, so the increase as far as um, the relationship is concerned for carbon to nitrogen would suggest that the, it's not organic carbon, but it, the, the carbon is coming from the actual carbonates itself. And this has been backed up by uh, covariance with calcium and strontium molar ratios. Um, and finally, as far as geochem is concerned, um, we've got nitrogen uh, 15. Um, majority of it is below 7, except in the horizon. And this is to be expected. This is basically due to uh, high organic content. But that's as much as we can say about the geochemical analysis at the moment. Um, as far as the small smallholder management strategies are concerned, we basically asked um, a gender and generational balanced um, like um, group of um, the community about water management, about soil classification, and about plant cropping. And this is some of the um, these are some of the answers. As far as the community is concerned, they don't rotate crops, but they do intercrop with black beans and maize. They're allocated water. Um, they're allocated water on a three-week basis, unless they're growing tomatoes or something. Um, and then if they have succulent crops, then they get more water if they need it. Um, and there was two types of soil identified by the community. However, the banana grove smallholder also had an extra one. He had uh, another kind of soil um, that indicated that yes, he understood that he had manured soils. And as far as animal grazing was concerned, the banana grove farmer grazed his um, animals on the fields because they ate the stubble, they also augmented his soil. It's not what he said, but that's what we take from it. Um, Whereas a lot of the other community thought that it ruined the soil. 
So as far as the conclusions we can draw from this, which are quite tentative at the moment, um, sediments across the site are the same, microstructure is different between section four and the banana grove, and yes, we can see augmentation, yeah? Although, as I forgot to add, the farmer told me he didn't add anything burnt which obviously we can see, but yes, you did add stuff burnt. <laughs> uh, as far as geochem is concerned, um, pH values, as we expect, are lower in the banana grove, and this is coming from the organic matter. Um, however, we're being speculative as far as um, nitrogen and phosphorus are concerned, because what we can see is the retention suggests that the soils weren't infertile when this place was abandoned. That's a shocker. Um, so it wasn't necessarily the source of abandonment. So what are the implications as far as food security are concerned? Because um, we've had a lot of talks today, yeah, but we have to be able to imply and we have to be able to prove that this has got some greater purpose that we're actually doing. And hopefully this has. Um, so the local agricultural management and knowledge of the actual soils themselves are basically key to reclaiming these archaeological sediments that were initially thought to be degraded. And if you turn, if you can remember the first photograph when we had the um, the, the the very semi-arid area and the banana grove itself, the comparisons are unbelievable. So basically, returning degraded soil to sustainable agricultural um, production provides yields not only to sustain the small holder, but it also provides him with an income, his family with extra nutrients. It allows him to invest in future landscape investments. And he also, he can educate his offspring, which is amazing, really. Um, so basically these methods of localised management um, also realise the FEO's 2015 goals to increase food security by main maintaining its primary factor, which is soil security. Thank you.